Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to How to Protect Your Arduino Design Part 2. And in this two-part series, we talk about tips for making your design electrically rugged, how to protect it from electrical damage to make sure you have a long-lasting, reliable design. If you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Forstronics YouTube channel, and let's get started. So in part one, we talked about protecting against power supply overvoltages. We talked about protecting IO pins against overvoltage and overcurrent conditions. In part two, we're going to talk about electrostatic discharge or ESD. And so if you haven't seen part one, I'd recommend checking that out because I do reference it a couple times in this video. And in part two, we are focusing on ESD, but it can really be protection methods for real fast high power voltage surges. So ESD or maybe an arc from a motor, but, but mainly I'm going to focus on the ESD aspect. So if you're not familiar with ESD or electrostatic discharge, it's basically when a potential becomes so large that it's able to flow in the face of a dielectric barrier. And a dielectric barrier basically means insulation barrier. So for humans, this is when you get static buildup on you and you touch a doorknob or something and you see a spark, an arc jump from your hand to the doorknob. That's essentially an ESD event, where in that case, the air is the dielectric or the insulation, and you have such a charge built up on you that it's able to jump that gap to a conductor. So for semiconductor-based electronics, whether it's a microcontroller or some kind of transceiver chip, they do not like very high voltages. And as you can see, ESD from a static, from a human touch, can be one kilovolt and up. Now, it's a very short pulse. There's not a lot of power behind it, not a lot of current, but it can be very high voltage and it can damage semiconductor devices. So why is this important for design? Well, if you have something that has a button on it, the outside of that button may be plastic, may be a dielectric barrier. But if you have enough static buildup on you that can jump the barrier of that button to the wire inside or the metal inside, and then all of a sudden it's getting to the digital or analog pin that you have that device connected to or the button connected to or any type of interface thing that people are touching. So that's when ESD becomes uh, a big hazard. And in this video, I'm not going to talk about, you know, all the different comprehensive ways to protect against ESD. I mean, you can do things as, such as uh, mechanical protection, you know, metal shields behind the button. I'm just talking about the easiest way. I want to talk about the most common, easiest way to protect against ESD or voltage surges. And so that leads me into the main topic, and that's transient voltage suppression diodes, or TVS diodes. So you can see a schematic symbol of them. They can be unidirectional or bidirectional, so they can be set up to protect against positive overvoltages or positive and negative overvoltages. And you can see they look a lot like a Zener diode, and guess what? They work a lot like a Zener diode. They work in a reverse bias manner, meaning you connect them in reverse bias, let's say between your a digital I.O. pin that you have connected to a button, the cathode, and then you connect the anode to ground. And then if the breakdown voltage of the diode is surpassed, current will flow. What makes them different than a simple Zener diode is they're made to turn on very fast because, you know, a shock is a very fast event, a very high rise in fall time. And so these diodes can turn on in a picosecond to not allow that voltage to ramp up and to shunt that current and that power from your static discharge to ground right away. Very fast turn on. They also can handle high peak power. Now, they can't keep that power continuous and and survive, but if, if it's just a very high peak of power that's very momentary, they can handle that. Let me show you a very popular model from Fairchild Semiconductor. Okay, here we have a TVS diode. You can see some of its specs. It can handle up to 600 watts peak power, so that's a lot of power for a small device. This here is a surface mount device, but it just can't handle that power continuously, only peak. You can see this one has a turn on time of one picosecond and five nanoseconds for bidirectional. Here are the absolute maximum values. Uh, let me see if it does give you a, doesn't give you a time here for it. 
Now here's the common characteristic. So if you remember when I showed you the, uh, I think it was the Schottky diode or the Zener diode, they come in a lot of different voltage values, which, which makes sense. So you can choose whatever voltage protection value you need. Now there's a couple different voltage parameters here. So the reverse standoff voltage, this is basically the voltage level where no current, you know, below this voltage level, no current is really flowing through the diode. Once you get to this voltage level, a little bit of current flows through the diode, but the circuit can still act normal. The diode is fairly high impedance, but you're getting a little current flow. The breakdown voltage is where current really starts to flow. And so you can give you, they give you a range here. And then the clamping voltage is where the TVS will no longer allow the voltage to go any higher, so it'll shunt maximum current. It'll clamp that that voltage, and it won't allow it to go any higher. You can see that that's quite a range here. But remember, this is a pretty fast event, so the idea here is hopefully the event is so fast that that the device itself won't actually experience a voltage this high. The TVS will turn on so quick and shunt things to ground. So let's talk about TVS application tips. First of all, we, we want to combine the TVS diode with a series current limiting resistor. So if we're using a digital pin or an analog pin, we want to have this series limiting resistor. And I talked about those in part one. We want to have those closer to the pin or the device we're protecting. We want to have the TVS farther away. And that leads into the second tip is where to locate the TVS diode. So we want to locate the TVS diode as far away as possible. I shouldn't say as far away as possible, as close as possible to the source of the uh, ESD. So to the close to the button, close to the edge of the PCB layout. Here I'm showing an image that I got from on semiconductor application note, which just focuses on where to put the TVS. And the whole idea is we want the TVS close to the source. Why? Well, first of all, there's going to be parasitics in your circuit. So the parasitics can actually slow down, you know, parasitic inductance, parasitic capacitance can slow down the reaction of the TVS. So we want the TVS closer to the event so it turns on right when it experiences it. And guess what? Those same parasitics and that same length of run between the TVS and the device you're trying to protect can prevent high voltages from getting to the, the IC. So we want the TVS as close as possible to the source of the ESD. Okay, that's all for how to protect your Arduino design, part two. Here we talked about electrostatic discharge and how to protect against that. Once again, this wasn't meant to be comprehensive. I just wanted to focus on some of the most common ways to protect your design electrically. And if you have your own tips, I know in the first one, someone shared a comment on, you know, I was talking about the Schottky diodes and they, they commented on how Schottky diodes are not high power. So if you need a high power protection, they mentioned MOSFET. So if anybody has protection tips to add on, please use the comments section for either part one or part two. Thank you for watching.